Okay. All right, so <clears throat> this is a June meeting of the Web Urgency Working Group, and we abide by the W3C patent policy. So only people and companies listed on the status page are able to make contributions. We're going to talk about the Web Urgency Working Group rechartering, uh, region capture, region capture extensions, and face detection today. Uh, in terms of future meetings, we'll have one on July 19th. We will skip the month of August, and then we will have our TPAC meetings. Um, so far, we have Web RTC Working Group's meeting scheduled for the 12th and 13th of September, and then a joint meeting with the Media Working Group and the Media Entertainment Interest Group on the 15th of September. So that's our schedule for the next couple of months. Okay, uh, we have the slides up on the wiki. Do we have a scribe? Someone to take minutes. I can scribe the part where I'm not talking at least. Okay, well, thank you, Don. Right, a little reminder about the code of conduct. We operate under it and we're all passionate about improving what we're to see, but let's try to keep the conversations cordial and professional. Um, we're going to use the plus Q and minus Q to uh, get into and out of the speaker queue. Uh, just a reminder this meeting is being recorded. Please use headphones or an echo canceling speakerphone and uh, state your full name so we can get it in the minutes. Uh, I don't think we'll, I don't know if we'll be doing a poll today, I suspect not, but we, we have the mechanism available. Uh, just a few words about document status, just because something is in the W3C repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. Uh, we use a call for adoption to do that. And editor's drafts don't represent working group consensus, but working group drafts do once they're confirmed by a CFC. It is possible to merge BRs, but you should attach a note if it's controversial. All right, here's the issues for discussion today. We're going to start off with a recharter, then get into region capture and face detection. Tom, you have the floor. Yes, so uh, as you probably know, our working group operates under a charter that we need to uh, renew every so often, in general, every two years. Uh, the current charter under which we operate is expiring by the end of September, given that <clears throat> the process to get a charter uh, renewed uh, needs some processing time, including review by the WCC Advisory Committee. Uh, we need to finalize what we want to put in our next charter ASAP. I, I had sent a heads up on this uh, back in May, I believe. Um, so based on what I understand our goals, uh, I've been working on a draft charter, which is linked from uh, the, the slide. Uh, basically, at the moment, it's mostly continuation of our existing work, including some of the new specs that have emerged over the past uh, couple of years. Um, I guess one big question that uh, Bernard raised as issue 70 on the repo where the charter is being developed is whether we should continue the work on all the, the items that are currently uh, under the ownership of this group. Um, as you probably know, this group has been responsible for both for doing all the integration in real-time uh, communications protocol uh, since its inception, but also doing um, most, if not all, of the work in terms of capturing media uh, that can be sent over this real-time communication protocol. Uh, one recurrent discussion we have each time we look at this charter is whether we should uh, split uh, that work, uh, migrate uh, media capture work to, to another group. Uh, in issue 70, Harold, uh, I think, suggested a potential group that could 
uh, host such work would be um, the media working group, uh, who's obviously dealing with media. So anyway, I, I guess uh, what I would like to hear from you all today is uh, first whether there are any other changes that we need to discuss for this uh, new charter beyond the, the list of deliverables and on the particular questions around uh, where the work on uh, media capture should be done, whether it should be moved to another group or not, whether there are work items we should consider dropping from the charter. So these are the, the two kind of input I'm looking for today. Um, as a clarification, if we um, migrate specs to media working group, that probably means that the media working group will also need to recharter, correct? Um, I haven't looked into it. It depends on whether the charter is flexible in terms of scope or not. But um, I would say, so if we were to suggest that uh, clearly we would need a uh, very strong coordination with the media working group and that may indeed include uh, having them rechartering. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head whether that would be necessary or not. Yeah, I think that's what I heard. Yeah, if, if they if they have a list of deliverables in their charter, they will, they will need to recharter, whether that's a formality or not, I don't know. Yeah, I would note that we have an upcoming meeting on September 15th, a joint meeting with the media working group. So this might be a topic to explore uh, at that time. Yeah, although as I noted on the issue, uh, we can't afford to wait until then to make a decision. Like we, we need to start the recharting oh, okay. process uh, basically now, so. Oh, okay. Hmm. So we basically have to recharter with the assumption that they don't take it over because we are, we don't have enough time to give us so to, 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 to conclude that discussion. So uh, I don't think we can afford to wait until September to have the discussion. Uh, but if we were starting the discussion now and with a conclusion that we would need to keep operating under the current charter for say three more months, we could extend the current charter while we go through uh, the administrative year, but, but I don't think we should wait until September when we know it would be too late, no matter what, to to have the conversation if that's a conversation we want to have. What what I know is that from an administrative point of view, uh, every time we change charter the scope, even though it's just migrating one uh, item to the other, then on our side we have to to do some uh, uh, assessment and so on, and it can take time and so on. So it's not it's not free to do the migration at least for us so there, there should be some uh, uh, good benefits to do the migration so dom are there some additional meetings or other things we should be setting up uh on this topic before September? Well, if the sense from the group is that we would like the media working group to take over some or all of the media capture work, uh, yes, we should have uh, meetings with at the very least the media working group uh, chairs to discuss whether they would be willing to do so in the first place right. and uh, then uh, coordinate on uh, what it would take to make it happen. But, but the first part of the question is really for us to say, uh, is it something we want to do or something we want to explore or is it just not a priority? Uh, and I guess UN was saying uh, we, we should have good reason to make that decision because it's not cost free. Yeah, one thing I would observe is that uh, there is a a whole bunch of different working groups that are working on specs that interact with video frame. And I think this is causing problems. We're seeing it already. Uh, 
and and also encoded chunks where we're getting out of sync in different specs and things that are fall are falling between the cracks. So I do think there's definitely an issue there um, with too many working groups involved in that in that work. So I've got a question, and that is. Um... How busy is the media working group in general and how is their capacity for taking on additional work? Because I would mostly be concerned about whether this increases the pace in which we make progress or decreases it. I think that's something that we would have to discuss with the chairs of the of that working group. Well, I mean, uh, I, like s some people in this group are also involved in media, the media working group, so maybe they can share actual uh, insights. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I will say that they do have uh, a number of other work, including uh, web codecs, media capabilities, um, which obviously come also with a, a set of challenges, controversies, and uh, uh, Coordination, coordination needs. So, um, like, uh, I think Bernard's point that there is uh, a structural argument around it for uh, because of the common common use of video frame uh, makes sense. Conversely, I guess um, the work we've been doing has quite a bit of intersection with real time communication. It's not. Uh, uh, by mistake that we've been doing this work. So I I guess I'm saying I, I don't know that there are huge productivity win uh, that you should expect. Uh, maybe a different perspective, like more media focused and uh, uh, transmission focused. But that's, uh, that's my slightly uninformed perspective, I guess. So should we say that, should we uh, say that uh, this is something that the chairs need to discuss with the with with the uh, the media chairs and uh, report back to the group as soon as possible? Uh, yes, I think I think uh, given the timeline, we probably need to do that. Yep. Uh, and oh, I guess we should delete from the charter. So, on the media migration question, I guess I just want to make sure that nobody has uh, fundamental op oppositions to to that notion, because okay, I wouldn't want to go into complex uh, the world walls migration if it's to get an objection <laughs> once we actually propose it. Okay, so I'm not hearing uh, objections. Okay. Uh, oh, can we move on? All right, so next topic is region capture. Uh, we've got two things to discuss today, issues 17 and 18. Uh, 17 will probably take most of the time. We have a, we'll have a presentation from Jan Ivar about uh, proposing sync usage for crop target. And then Elad will present the case for async and then we'll have a shared discussion. Um, and then we'll talk about issue 18. So Jan Ivar, we'll turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so yes, so this is about uh, crop two, uh, which also uh, which you pass an argument to uh, to uh, crop self capture uh, to an element in a way that um, is consistent and doesn't rely on coordinates and has some benefits. So um, the issue threads on this, these issues, issue seventeen and related issues, have gotten really long and impenetrable. 
So we have Slideware to highlight what is the outstanding issues in order to invite the larger working group to participate in decisions. So you'll hear two views and I'm up first. And I'll try to explain the API as I go for those who haven't followed closely. So I intend to present arguments that I hope we can discuss from first principles that I hope can be rebutted with counter arguments to find solutions for them or show why they're not a problem. Uh, this is our process and we're following it. It's the working group that has the domain knowledge to design APIs. And it's not the tag's job, for instance, to call winners or losers on API design, especially not in first public working group. If that were the process, we could just ban this working group and save a lot of time. So, but what the tag does provide is a list of design principles. And among them are, uh, sorry, can we go back a slide? Yes, yeah, so um, among those principles, uh, they have, I'm going to mention three. One is on consistency, uh, constructors for new objects, and this one, which you see here, which is, which is to use synchronous APIs when appropriate. And you'll see uh, there are some exceptions to this, and one of them is inter-process communication. Uh, Elad, uh, do you want to jump in here, or is this for later discussion? I would not want to interrupt your flow. Okay. All right, thanks. So next slide. <clears throat> So uh, right now, the current API, and, and uh, at first I was going to write current API. The problem is that what's in the spec right now is what I mean. And there's a note in the spec that says the current API does not have consensus, which was added for first public working guy. So I'm calling it non-consensus API here just to be clear that uh, these are equal proposals in my mind. So currently, uh, you, you have to mint a crop target. And uh, this is because, uh, for reason I'll come back to later. So the question here for the working group, uh, does this need to be an asynchronous method? So right now in the spec, in the non-consensus note, says uh, you have to await crop target from element, and then you mint a crop target object instead of the element. Now, why would we do that? It's because we might need to post message this element to another um, realm, and you can't do that with elements. So we get this sort of reference handle instead. So what I'm proposing is that we don't need this to be async. You can just create a new crop target and pass in the element. And that would be a synchronous API. And this is because the purpose of this target is to associate a serializable identifier with an element, which we'll call minting. And the spec says uh, calling from element with an element of a supported type associates that element with a crop target. Crop target is an intentionally empty opaque identifier and its purpose is to be handed to crop2 as input. So as currently specified, this cannot fail for non-synchronous reasons. But an issue has been opened, uh, which I'll talk about here later, uh, about exposing resource failures. <clears throat> and so here's an example where you have an iframe. Uh, you mint a crop target from an element in an iframe. It could be uh, a different origin. And you post message it to a top-level document uh, that is doing screen capture, self-capture through screen sharing. And it has a video track on, upon which you call crop2 with that crop target. Now, if this were all the same document, you could have just passed in the element. So crop target serves a really useful purpose here. But the testable requirement here is that crop2 must accept it at this point. Uh, it must be ready to accept it. But that doesn't require both the minting API and the cropping method to be asynchronous. Next slide. So this is where um, this might be confusing, but I'll work through it. Uh, this, if you're not familiar with the API, hopefully this might actually help. Uh, my point here is that multiple actions need to happen before we're cropping anything. And this diagram shows that uh, uh, vertically you have time progressing, and on the left you have a to the top level document. In the middle you have the iframe, and some notes about optimizations on the right. So the first thing that happens on any random page on the web, it doesn't know if it's been captured yet, is that you mint a crop target for an element because uh, and this could be done ahead of time, which is shown here, or it could be done later. Um, so a decision then is what, what does the JavaScript do next? It can do nothing, in which case uh, nothing happens. So, uh, or it can post message it to the top level document. And, uh, where it receives this token, and then nothing can happen, or the user pushes a button, 
which uh, to present something in which case the top level JavaScript calls get display media or get viewport media and prompts the user for capture. The user may cancel or the user may select a different capture. Uh, in, in both cases, nothing happened. And finally, we see that the app application, the top level document application decides to crop. Uh, it has a screen sharing track. It's, just, it's turned on capture, it's capturing, and it's now uh, wants to crop to that target. At this point, is the only point where there really is a known intent to crop. <clears throat> so uh, user agents can jump the gun here, but uh, to optimize this, and as I've shown on the, on the right, you can optimize quite early. But if you do, you run a lot, run a lot of risks, and you have to actually then um, handle the case that maybe you prematurely optimize because you don't actually know that you capture that you're going to be capturing yet. So that's the main problem with uh, early optimization. It's a good thing we want to allow it, but it's 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 quite a complicated problem to solve for user agents, and it's better not to to bother web developers with it. You can still have a clean API by basically having a fallback at the very end, call it the unoptimized IPC, uh, if you will, so that you can, because uh, you don't have to, for optimization, you, you rarely need to optimize. The first step of optimization is knowing what to optimize and not necessarily think you need to optimize every edge case. And there are a lot of edge cases here, some of which I've shown with the red symbols here. Uh, next slide. So um, uh, another reason for why it needs to be async is that uh, there's a new request on the spec to change. The original spec said it was infallible, but there's a new request to say that we want to be able to fail, reject the promise from the minting process because of resource exhaustion error. Uh, and presumably this is because Chrome has implemented some optimizations. They allocate cropping resources this early, which I've shown uh, has a lot of um, complexity, uh, but rather than having a fallback, they would rather uh, basically fail to web, uh, web developer JavaScript. <clears throat> but let's look at and see if that uh, creates any problems. So this would allow random JavaScript in would be captured documents to exhaust cropping resources. And that seems bad. Uh, so if you have a JavaScript library that you're importing that has nothing to do with cropping, it could cause action at a distance by basically calling this API over and over. It's not behind any permission. So any JavaScript can do it. And basically doing a denial of service attack on the cropping uh, function without user permission. And defeat cropping. Now, defeating cropping may actually expose private user information in unsuspecting poorly written apps, which is a foot gun. Uh, because the app may have been designed to never been tested what would happen if cropping resources fail? And what happens? We know there are bugs then. If you don't test something, the worst will happen, which is that the, the app will then, instead of cropping to uh, exclude important information, it will now sh show and screencast everything. And uh, I hope I've also shown that early research allocation is inherently unnecessary. It's a premature optimization to vo avoid doing IPC and crop to later. Now, denial of the this sort of denial of service is avoided by simply doing IPC and resource allocation in crop two. So with, with that as the baseline, any earlier resource allocation is purely a uh, user agent optimization whose cost and complexity should be borne by the user agent. There's precedent here that I want to mention. One of them is media source get handle, which produces a media source handle, which is again an opaque object for the sole purpose of post messaging. And also, another precedent is that bigger elements, bigger objects like element and message port, uh, which have actual functionality, they don't exhaust any problem in the platform. And the platform is confident enough to say that we don't need to bother JavaScript developers with uh, their failure of allocation. Now, there, I think there's also other privacy issues here is that exposing a, a user age, well, Resource limits uh, have several problems. They're implementation defined, which means that it leaks information. Uh, it's, if this is a global resource limit, it potentially would leak cross-origin correlatable information. So what you'd have to do instead is provide, uh, to, to, to combat that, you'd need local per document limits. 
uh, that are much, obviously must be smaller. <clears throat> and these would risk becoming exhaustible much sooner to the point where you could even have well-designed apps that maybe sit in an open tab for a long time. You can eventually run into this limit. So again, web compatibility issues. And web developers are unlikely to ever expect or check for exhaustion. And again, the better approach would be to have the user agent handle this and not fail. Basically, they, they could still optimize for well-designed apps and fall back to this baseline. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, uh, performance. <clears throat> uh, Jennifer, I'm very sorry, but yes. um, I think it might be better if I interrupt now. Is that OK? Um, I think I would prefer to get through to the end because uh, okay. we have a pretty tight time line. So I'm trying to spend two minutes per slide. So I think I only have uh, two more slides. Does that work? It's this one and one more slide. As you wish. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, performance. Uh, so a part of the spec that doesn't have consensus says the user agent must resolve the promise only after it has finished all the necessary internal propagation of state associated with a new crop target at which point the user agent must be ready to receive the new crop target as a valid parameter to crop to. No question, uh, no problem with the last part, but the issue here is that, uh, what does this mean? Uh, because modern browsers use process separation of iframes, which means there's going to be IPC of both uh, state propagation and post message. So looking at the earlier example of the iframe, I've added some arrows here about what would happen. Uh, and arrows up means, uh, out of process, basically. So you call crop target from element, and the spec says to do state propagation, which is really you know pre-optimized resource allocation for cropping, which would need to go under a master process. So you send one IPC, and it also says we can't uh, we can't resolve the promise until that has succeeded. So that's a second IPC coming back uh, to say that the resource allocation has succeeded. And then now JavaScript, only now does JavaScript get to have the target that it can then post message, which is a third IPC. So this API actually serializes those three IPCs, uh, which is slower than running IPC in parallel. You could, you could have the state propagation happen and still uh, resolve immediately, or basically have it be synchronous, in which case it would be up to crop to to handle this race, which it which can it can handle either approach basically so the proposed the api i'm proposing here i think is faster simpler and still optimizable and this satisfies uh the design rule that the api implementation will not block you know one of the exceptions for the synchronous apis was if it was blocked on inter process communication and i think this shows that we don't need to block on inter process communication in fact it makes it uh, slower um, next slide. Uh, so this is my conclusion slide. So uh, on the previous slide, I also want to say that you'll hear Chrome saying that they'll need this. And I hope I've shown that they only need it because they have no fallback. They can easily optimize within this synchronous API as well, and it would just be even faster. And it could have a fallback for to handle the edge cases, which I think is a much better solution because that uh, doesn't have the inherent problems that I'm uh, pointing out. I like uh, denial of service of the cropping resource and exposing uh, potentially uh, and privacy risks and um, uh, potentially fingerprinting information. So a synchronous API does not limit optimization. I think the burden is on user agents to optimize within that API because a failure of optimization doesn't have to mean a failure of the operation. Uh, implement a baseline and crop to and to fall back on. <clears throat> and I think what we're also seeing here is that because um, when optimization and implementation influences API decisions, I think we see that um, since optimization is quite difficult, uh, we see new issues being opened on the working uh, group here. And that's, I think that's the, because optimizations will have side effects. There might be new information later about how to optimize better. And I think my prediction will be, we'll see new issues being opened if we don't close this gap. And basically say optimization should not influence the API uh, and it would not be a good use of working group time. 
let's be done. Uh, there's no inherent need and no developer benefit to it being async. And async APIs goes against the W3C design principle I mentioned earlier, which is uh, consistency with uh, media source get handle, uh, having an object constructor for new objects and being synchronous when possible. <clears throat> There's a developer cost as well to asynchronous APIs that are quite general. Every await is a preemption point in JavaScript. JavaScript is single threaded. So a preemption point, uh, single threaded means you don't have to worry about locking in order to read data. But as soon as you do an await, you have to reassess all state or risk databases. And also, it's, it spreads like wildfire, because much like const, non-const methods in C++, uh, if a method you call is asynchronous, you have to be asynchronous, and the caller of you has to be asynchronous, So, uh, which is unfortunate, but reality. Um, and also having multiple process failure points for extremely rare resources uh, is also risky because web developers would, might not expect or test for it. And I've also shown that it's slower delaying when post message can happen. And uh, I'm happy to discuss performance. Uh, there might be other cases like if you wanted to have multiple resources and you wanted to do like, uh, like the one area it might be a benefit is if you want to do this kind of flip book between multiple targets that you've prepared already. But yeah, in that so case, I think it can be shown that we can we have, have we, we now have one minute for discussion. Yes. So I, I, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I'm going to go over oh. time, and I'm sorry, and I, I'm going to have to uh, say a couple of things. So oh, first, of I, all, I think, I think we said uh, if there were any questions about what I proposed, and we'll also have general discussion at the end, right? Sure. I've got two questions, but I need to set up uh, a quick uh, setup for this. So first, you've mentioned uh, first principles, and I think that yes, uh, we should debate this on first principles. But the tag does not only offer design principles; it also uh, sets the meta discussion. Right? It, it talks about how we can even have a productive discussion. So I think that it is not necessarily productive for us to discuss other uh, the browsers, um, other browsers optimizations. And specifically, when you talk about resource ex exhaustion and how it could serve for fingerprinting, that is a valid concern. But nobody is forcing you to actually uh, allocate resources to, nobody is forcing you to actually um, exhaust them and to allow, allow this. So if you think that this is a bug in Chrome's implementation, that's very good. And we can solve that bug over time. But nobody is forcing you to replicate this bug. Similarly, uh, nobody is forcing you to uh, propagate state only when you, at one point or another, the way the that which is currently phrased, you could have, uh, you could just resolve the promise immediately, never allocate anything, never fail, and uh, I just don't understand. So if you could just explain to me in what way the current text is limiting your implementation and forcing you to make design decisions you do not wish. Well, well I'm not here to talk implementation so much as the API. And I think that the API should be uh, designed based on principles that the tag has uh, put forth. And I've shown three of them. And I've also shown some problems that I hope uh, can be counter argued from first principles, why they're not important or uh, why they're not, um, uh, how they can be solved. I just don't and understand think... how they're relevant. <clears throat> okay, uh, fair enough. I, I don't, this is for the entire working group, so. Um, I don't understand your question. My question is, clearly... how, so un unless the API forces you to uh, replicate uh, Chrome's problems, what does it matter if Chrome has made problems, has got problems well, in their implementation? Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying Mozilla should only care about its own, its own browser. And the, the spec, yes. OK, well, we're here to, to make a, a better API for the web. So I think yes. uh, that is the answer to your question. Okay, I will address this on my part. I think that we're two minutes into it, so I'll, I'll probably have to start immediately. And if somebody wants to uh, sure. take the discussion time. No, oh, okay, so uh, thank you, I will start now. Uh, so as Yaniva has mentioned, and thank you for uh, introducing the API. Uh, this is an API for cropping video targets. Uh, it was proposed one and a half years ago by yours truly. Chrome has implemented it, and Google products have actually started using it in origin trial and soon in actual production uh, um, when it's shipped, but right now it's already in production. Very big products such as Meet, Docs, Slides, 
and it's been better tested. So now it works, and we know that the uh, developers are happy, and we know that the customers are happy. And while we were implementing this, we learned a lot of lessons. And Mozilla and Apple have not so far, as far as I know, implemented this. Next slide, please. So as we know, cropping involves a target. The target can be in another document, which means that you cannot pinpoint the element without actually having a crop target. And the question here revolves around whether this, uh, the minting of this token should be uh, sync or async. And I'm going to claim, A, uh, that um, I'm going to explain Chrome's decisions. I'm not going to go into too many, too many details. And then I'm going to claim that this uh, decision does not come at a cost to anybody else, not to users, not to developers, not to other implementers. And then I'm going to ask if this is the case, if nobody is impacted, why are we still debating this five months after the issue was initially raised? Next slide, please. So just to uh, remind everybody of Chrome's implementation, which uh, is we're not mandating that anybody else follow the same implementation. We're just explaining Chrome's rationale. So first of all, you've got the captured uh, document on the left. The captured document means a token that involves an IPC in Chrome's implementation, not necessarily in anybody else's implementation. And once you've got this crop target, it's not only that the captured document has it, the browser is now aware of it. And the browser knows that if anybody is capturing that particular document, that crop target would be relevant. But if anybody is capturing a different document, then this crop target is irrelevant. Next thing that happens is step number three, the capture document posts it to another document. At any given time, the capturer can start capture, maybe it was before, maybe after the token was received, and it can now decide it wants to start cropping. It calls crop two on the track, and this triggers an IPC to the browser and GPU processes. And when that happens, this is where the magic enters, because in our implementation, the browser immediately knows if this crop target is a crop target that's actually associated with the tab that be, that's being captured. So it immediately knows if it can start cropping, in which case it can start cropping and issue the uh, success IPC. And if this crop target does not actually is not alive anymore uh, or in any way or comes from a different tab, right, using a broadcast channel and is completely irrelevant for cropping here, then the browser can just issue an error. And when that happens, that happens without ever talking to the capture document. So this is A, simpler, and B, more performant, especially if there is CPU congestion and uh, main thread uh, contention on the capture document. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, simpler, more performant, and you'll notice that there are no race cases here, because by the time that the capture document, uh, I'm sorry, the capturing document gets the token, that token is ready to be used. Whereas with some alternatives that have been debated at length on issue number 17, um, there was basically an, uh, an IPC being sent in both directions at the same time, one to the browser process and one to the capture document. And you can imagine that there are cases where one IPC would reach faster than the other. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, and one more. Th okay, next slide, please. So, Basically, I claim that we've got a, um, an argument here between a party that needs this to be async and the party that just wants it to be async. And then the question is why? So Chrome needs it because we've got a certain set of trade-offs. Other sets of trade-offs are possible, but we've got our own philosophy and we want to implement according to it. Mozilla could implement according to their own philosophy regardless of whether this is sync or async, but they want this to be Think. Now, that's fine, but for that, they need to show that there is an actual problem with making this sync, uh, I'm sorry, async, regardless of implementation, or that one of the uh, constituencies is uh, actually impacted by this negatively. Next slide, please. So, as we know, this is the text. It's a little bit uh, much, but that's the original text with a reduction. So, the needs of users come first, then web developers, then uh, browser implementers, spec authors, and then a surprise at the end. Let's uh, examine how almost all of them are impacted because I think spec authors are a little bit irrelevant right now. Next slide, please. So users, users don't know if this is sync, async, they don't care. Users want their software to be performant, available on all browsers, and available yesterday. 
So I think that we don't really need to consider them here because they're on, uh, they're, they just don't care. Uh, web developers, well, uh, we can guess what they think, or we could ask them. And we have asked them, and they've provided feedback. They've said that they simply don't care if this is async. Most developers that are going to use this already are already maintaining very large applications, very complex, millions of lines, and they don't care if we just add a word of weight. Now, we could think that in theory, maybe this slots right into the place, one place where it would otherwise be a problem. But so far, no web developer has come and explained that this was an issue for them. And also on GitHub, we have discussed if this were an issue, how we could have actually uh, gone around this issue. So the third constituency is implementers. And I happen to be an implementer and to represent other implementers in Chromium. And we say that this is imperative for us. So whereas the other two constituencies did not care, we care. And because it's of no impact to them, now it's our turn. Next slide, please. So is there a problem with if the constituencies are not the thing that are going to make us decide to make this synchronous, what else is there? Theoretical purity or design principles laid out by tag? Well, Yanivar has actually presented a slide where it said that, you know what, if IPCs are involved, asynchronous APIs are actually quite appropriate. So that design principle, at least, is not a reason for go to go for synchronicity. But tag has actually said, more interesting things, both in general, as well as about this particular API and this particular question. Next slide, please. If you remember the slide that had a small redaction, it mentioned this. The last thing to come is theoretical purity. There is no, um, so uh, the needs of implementers actually come two steps about, about theoretical purity. So this would not actually be a reason for us to make this sync when one uh, implementer really claims that this is necessary to be uh, async. Next slide, please. Tag actually uh, discussed this particular API. So first of all, about the API as a whole, they said, we reviewed it and we're satisfied. But then when this debate raged for a few months, Tag also made a, a comment on the meta discussion here. And I think that we should actually pay attention. So let's read. First, they said, uh, so Sanguan said, I have looked at this discussion and think the developer ergonomic gains would be minimal. I don't see a significant gain in terms of ergonomics for developers with sync. Then he said, it's fine to be a sync, async. So this looks good. But then, so this is first principles. But now let's talk about the meta discussion, please. So then said, we can feedback that interoperability is an imperative. And then he said, the issues of interop are many. This is something that should be guiding the working group's uh, work. That should be the primary goal of anything, not the most elegant or correct API. Next slide, please. So um, I've demonstrated that all constituencies either are do not care about this uh, or they actually need this. So that's, there is no reason to go synchronous there. Furthermore, um, I think that if it's a more uh, flexible solution, right? Because if you've got uh, a synchronous API, it's trivial to make it asynchronous. And by making it synchronous, we're actually, we would be constraining implementations such as Chrome's implementation. And I think that would be inappropriate. And I think that this uh, debate has gone on for too long. I think that we can do much better and move on to more productive work by just going with the interop solution. Uh, thank you very much. And yes, uh, Bernard, I'm ready for your question. You're muted. Okay, yeah. So um, one point that you made uh, a lot is that uh, by making this async, um, you basically, and the, and the IPC architecture, you know that when the uh, crop target returns that it's ready for use. Um, can you describe some of the things that in getting it ready for use that, that might uh, create a problem with a sync implementation? Like we've seen in WebRTC, there are situations where we've done sync APIs that turned out that actually needed to be async. We found that later because of things that weren't, that took some time. 
could you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, if you could go a couple of slides back, back to where I had the uh, diagram. That's going to help me a little bit. So um, we can imagine that if this were sync, then we've got two options, right? We could either block until we register things in the browser process. We wouldn't want to do that. And the other way that we could go is we could uh, embed all of the information that's necessary in the crop target when we mint it, do that in the render process on the top left, on the captured, captured side, and simultaneously send it both to the capture document as well as to the browser process. So that when the capture process goes and uh, calls crop two and asks the browser, hey, I want to start cropping to this, yes or no, this would already be there. But the problem is that it is not uh, guaranteed that the crop target is going to reach the browser process first from the capture document and not for the, from the capturing document. Mm -hmm. So now it could be said that, yes, this is an edge case. You can optimize for that. I think that the neighbor said that on GitHub at the very least, but I don't think that's worth the complexity because now we need to have complex. I think UN has also commented to that effect. So now we need to introduce very complex code that says, ah, okay, but if it's already here, I do one thing, but if it's not here, then I'm going to communicate back with the original render process and check, hey, are you still here? Have you just posted this to me, etc." And sure, such implementations would be possible, but there's always a trade-off between complexity and um, everything else. And I, I, we do not believe that this uh, trade-off would be favorable. Yes, Yuan. You are muted, Yuan. Yoniva uh, is in the queue first. Uh, My apologies. Uh, I, you, you can go first. I've talked a lot. Um, sure. So um, I, I'm surprised that you, you're saying that this is a, a must. Um, on past discussions, I think we agreed that this was implementable synchronously in, in Chrome or in, uh, in any browser. Uh, but my understanding was that you you were favoring uh, Chrome's current trade-offs, um, meaning that you you prefer that you do the pre-allocation at the time the crop uh, target is created, and not at the time of crop two. And right. this is the main motivation uh, for uh, an asynchronous API. That's my understanding. Mm. And uh, from what I understand from Yonivar's uh, approach. Uh, slides and that's also my understanding um i pointed out that uh in the last that this is a fingerprinting issue uh this is a potential interop issue as well um so that that's why i think the current um chrome's uh trade-offs uh with pre-allocating things might be fine but it's it's also a food gun and uh so in general i think that you prefer your current approach but you still agree with uh, being able to implement a synchronous API with similar trade-offs, except that you think that the implementation might be a bit more complex. So that, that's uh, that's really, I think, the, the core of the discussions there is that uh, both are implementable, but what you're saying is that uh, a synchronous API in Chrome would be more complex. Uh, oh, hey, I do not agree. No, sorry, do not agree. Uh, and... Um... I'd like to, to finish what I'm saying. So that, that was my first okay. point. Um, maybe I misunderstood, but I, I, I'm trying to narrow down exactly why you're asking for an asynchronous API. Um, I'm also surprised by the two presentations on the fact that they are both claiming that both approaches are more efficient, that both approaches are faster. They, they cannot be faster. <laughs> One needs to be faster than the other, uh, or maybe it's different cases, that it's uh, it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit misleading. So to me, the fact that in one case you can do things in parallel, and in the other case you're doing things uh, serially, uh, one after the other, that means that one will be faster than the other, at least for the user uh, of a web application. Um, usually, synchronous API are more efficient, except if you know that there will be something blocking. Uh, like uh, getting to hardware, uh, getting to files, hopping to thread, uh, and so on. Um, here, I'm, I'm not. I'm not hearing that. So I think that uh, a synchronous API is helping a bit web developers, 
it's not a huge deal, but it's still a, a tiny important thing. So I, I, I would hope that we can agree on which, which one is faster than the other as well. Oh. Okay, I would like to answer, and you've made two points. Uh, the first point uh, included the claim the, uh, about resource allocation. I think that is uh, irrelevant because resource allocation is not mandated by making this async. It's a design decision that we've made and we can always roll it back. Uh, you pointed out correctly the deficiencies of that and uh, it's up to us to decide uh, what to do with that. We're not mandating that you do uh, uh, anything similar just by making it async. Uh, that's can, I one. Can, I, can I answer to that? Yes. You're, you're saying we implemented, uh, we implemented uh, this and based on our implementation, we learned a lot of things and we are thinking that we should uh, do that in, in we should uh, build on that to uh, design the API. And what we are seeing is that with your current implementation, there are some potential is issues with, with regards to security, privacy, and uh, they are not solved. So I would feel much more comfortable if they were solved. And then you, you, were, you would say, hey, we, we solved all these things and now we can, we can say that this is good. Um, because you're asking, asking Cosmic City exactly for that reason. And that reason is actually uh, your implementation uh, it has some issues. And so that's why it's weakening uh, the asynchronous point. Uh, no, uh, that is not true. Uh, so it would be very easy for us to actually change the implementation in the following way. Each iframe has its own limit and therefore there is no leakage of information between iframes. And that would be trivial. And um, therefore I don't think that this is relevant and you don't need to have a limit on anything, right? So. I think that this is a, um, a red herring. And your second issue was about which one is faster. And that isn't it's something that needs to be debated. It is possible that for each implementation, things will be uh, uh, faster differently. But the claim that uh, Yanivar made about serial, uh, serializing multiple IPCs was unfortunate. I didn't have time to counter that. And that is, you can crop the target whenever you want. You can do this while the user is interacting with the prompt, right? You can do that um, before you even display the prompt to the user. So these are not in serial, these are quite parallel. Uh, we, we're, we're saying you crop a target and you post message. This, this is serial. Yeah, uh, you crop a target and you post that, but that does not actually limit the crop two. And crop two is the thing that's gonna take a while, that needs to be fast, right? Because when the user selects, I want to, uh, to capture this tab, and now you want to crop that tab, that's when you need to be fast. Everything that came before that, the user did not notice. The page loaded, so, the page minted the uh, crop target, the page posted the crop target in between its various sides, and all of this time the user was just moving slowly now to start the capture. And by the time you started the capture, all of that is already, all of this cost is already paid. So I think that what, what you're saying is that, um with a synchronous API, uh, creating a crop target and sending it to uh, the recipient is faster. No. That's, we do not debate that. Like no. you post message a crop target, uh, if, you, if you get it synchronously, it's faster than if you were waiting for the actual risk allocation to, to finish. I'm what sorry, you're that's the opposite, that, that's the inverse of what I'm saying. I'm just saying uh, you create a crop target and you post message it and you receive it on the page. You're saying that it's not, faster if you do async? I am saying that that cost is irrelevant and that all of this cost yeah. is... So I think we are agreeing that you create a crop target, you post message it and you receive it on a page, then the synchronous API is faster than the async one. What you're saying then is that uh, the, re the actual big latency thing is about crop two and that you think it's neglectable to uh, optimize the crop target uh, generation and this code path because crop two will take a lot of time. But is that correct? I don't want to say that everything you said was correct, uh, but I can say the following and you can decide. Uh, I'm saying that everything that comes before crop two and before get display media is co are called is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And all of those uh, uh, costs are indeed negligible. And the cost that matters is once the user decides uh, to start capture and capture starts if you now crop to how quickly does that happen and because now there's only a single ipc rt uh, round trip that is faster that is my claim 
Okay, we have Tim in the queue. Yeah, um, I'm, I don't know anything about the implementation, but from the point of view of um, a developer who does actually have an app, that, a small few hundred line app that would do this, I have a mild preference for um, it being synchronous because it's slightly tidier and slightly easier to use. Um, but I'd sacrifice that if I was convinced there was a user benefit or there was a developer benefit. Um, and I don't see a developer benefit to it being um, to it becoming async. Uh, this, and I imagine there might be a user benefit in terms of like the pre-crop somehow not like not 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 seeing the whole thing and then then it shrinking down to the crop area. I mean, if there's a visual twitch that's unavoidable, then like obviously getting rid of that's a huge win. Um, so that would be kind of my only overwhelming argument there is if that's somebody could convince me that that was going to happen, um, then I would kind of be interested. I, I think, um, you know, the other issue from the developer point of view is, is about whether the top level page sees whether there's a failure in whether, whether you're interested in any kind of failures in the resolving on crop two. On on, um, on 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 uh, obtain on obtaining a target. Is there a way of, of an interesting crop target failure mode? Because that would convince also convince me that um, that it needs to be async. But I haven't heard that, so I'm kind of unconvinced that it needs to be async. But I'm listening for reasons from a developer point of view. <laughs> The claim has never been that this can only be implemented if async. The claim has always been that there are multiple uh, sets of trade-offs. One of the sets of trade-offs requires this to be async for that trade-off. And there is one implementation that wishes to go for that set of trade-offs. And the other implementations are not going to suffer. Developers are not going to suffer. And users are not going to suffer. And therefore, it's quite appropriate to, um, to care about that implementer's needs. Okay, so I, I disagree that developers aren't going to suffer. They are going to suffer, just not very much. Okay, so if, if I'm going to uh, revise my claim, they're going to su suffer negligibly. I don't think it's even negligible. I did, like I've had a, a thing where, you know, something low level becomes a, an async method and then you have to spend an hour making sure that that kind of gets compartmentalized and doesn't spread its way throughout the whole damn code. So it's not trivial, but it, it isn't insoluble by any means. Okay, so uh, we've got Google developers saying it's negligible and Tim Panton says it is not negligible, but it is solvable. Did I get that correctly? Yeah, and I think the difference is that they are writing, as you say, millions of lines of code and I'm writing small apps. Um, but the web was built on small apps, so let's not forget them completely. I did not mention any kind of uh, um, I didn't say that you were less important. I was just listing all of the feedback that we've received so far. Uh, it's just setting the context of small apps versus big apps with different optimizations. Okay. I think we're at time, by the way. So right. Yen, I would not want I'm... to. Uh... Okay, Yanivar, it's between oh, you uh... and the uh, UN. Well, uh, if I, I did want to mention, since you mentioned uh, there were no downsides, uh, but nobody is claiming that the Chrome's optimizations aren't useful. Clearly, they are. But I'm confused. It sounds like you're claiming Chrome cannot do the same optimizations with a synchronous API with a completely synchronous API. And I don't understand that because uh, you haven't actually explained why you need it to be async, except for the fact that instead of falling back to something slower, you need to fail to the web developer. Why can't you implement a fallback? And uh, you? Uh, regarding the, uh, let me list the, uh, the downsides again to users, attack on the cropping service to defeat it. Uh, defeated cropping might leak private information. Resource leaks expose fingerprinting info. And to web developers, async is harder to use, introduces data races and proliferation of async. Uh, web developers have to deal with failure. And for spec authors, user agents uh, have been opening new issues 
uh, on the spec because of the, uh, they're chasing this implementing only an optimized design only. Right. How is this on the queue? So, well, I was wondering yes, why does it need to be async? So just speaking as uh, part of the web developer team, uh, code complexity is in is itself a danger to the to the to the process. This particular thing has been implemented, tested, and used in this way from the the idea that by raising more uh, more tickets that do not raise new issues on as child tickets on the on the tracker somehow shows that uh, that users are confused somehow it's just null and void and i could take issue with uh, the particular statements made uh, as uh, objections and note that anyone who depends on crop two and does not notice it failing has a problem anyway and it's time to stop this discussion somehow we have not see we have seen that chrome claims that implementation of async would significantly comp make the make the implementation significantly more complex and may, might expose other issues that we don't have with this implementation we have seen that uh, the impact on developers is well somewhat irritating but nobody's claimed that is fatal we have not seen a compelling argument that we need to change was what has been proposed so i would want to say that there is no consensus for change there is a, an implementation of the current spec we should close this point, declare that this function is async, and move on. Finished. I, I would still like to hear why uh, it, it must be async in order to yeah. do the optimization. Yeah, but if you haven't uh, gotten, the, gotten it the first 17 times, uh, I'm sorry. I understand. I, okay, ease, I ease of implementation. I don't know how to explain it to you uh, when you fair did enough. not understand my previous 17 versions. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. I think I hear ease of implementation. And I think uh, one of the rules is that complexity in API trumps complexity in implementation. So uh, that seems to be the trade off here. Where did you find that one? Priority of constituency. No, the priority of consistency says that the, the concerns of uh, of web developers come before the concerns of implementers. That's not the same thing as saying that uh, saying that the more complex API okay. that uh, that has. Uh, the, and, we've that agreed that the API the is more complicated. A more complex uh, API that does the right thing is better than the than a less complex API that does the wrong thing. In well, general principle, I'm not. I'm not saying that this is an example of that, but it's an example where, where it's important so, that your uh, that yeah. uh, your um, derived yeah. principle does, oh, not, yeah. does not apply. But I, I should yeah. shut up now. I've said that. Uh, my question is: What is the next step here? Do we take this to the list in a call for consensus? Uh, I with, think. 
So uh, I do not see any benefit in continuing with this discussion. I think that it has gone uh, well enough. I think that we've got many of uh, many other things to discuss on first principles and much more progress to do, uh, to have elsewhere. Uh, it could be that you know maybe this is the uh, suboptimal decision here. Maybe you are making a mistake, but it is quite a small mistake, and we our time would be better spent making other smaller mistakes that uh, advance the web and not dwelling on this particular one. Well, it would still be nice to hear why asynchronous is needed. You've been hearing it now for quite some time. I'm sorry. So, uh, are, we're already over time for the next presenter. So, so I have a question for Dom. Um, so clearly there's no consensus there. Um, we, we tried hard to, to get consensus. So what should we do in that situation? Um, I can suggest two paths. Uh, one would be to organize a formal vote of the working group, uh, which would say uh, each member organization gets one vote and we collate that and uh, this is used to determine the, the path forward. Uh, the other approach is to leave that issue open. Uh, I guess what I'm hearing is that a lot of it is bound to implementation experience, so maybe we leave that open until we get uh, other implementation experience that uh, shows an alternative path and brings more clarity as to what the right uh, trade-off should be. Um, so that would be my suggestions. I think that the second option is uh, most preferable. I'd like to note that uh, there's also not consensus on merging anything for issue 48, which means that as currently specified, there's no way for this asynchronous method to fail. So, so before a formal vote, should, should we do like a poll or is it like not useful to do a poll? Well, uh, Jan sure. yeah, there's no consensus to not merge anything on this year. 48 either. So you can't argue one way or the other. And at the moment, there's no nothing in the specification that allows this function to fail. Thank you, Kefra. Okay, so I'd, I'd, okay. Just like to say one more thing, but I'm almost that the argument it doesn't the stop browser making it um, async doesn't stop the other browser implementers doing it right and making it um, synchronous so effectively there synchronous. implementation so I, I would be inclined to say that like for the benefit of actually getting implementation in other browsers it would be well worth doing that I, I, Think it would be more elegant if it was were synchronous, but like we're not going to get that. I can tell. Nice closing words. Okay. Can we move on to issue 18? Let's move. You win. Okay. So issue 18, um, is core target name to generate? Um, so when I read the spec and I saw so core target, I wasn't sure exactly what, what it meant. Uh, it's made of two very generic terms, crop and, and target, and it, it, it wasn't very clear to me what, 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 what the scope was. I wasn't even sure what crop was a, a good idea, given uh, it's used a lot in images, so I was thinking that maybe it would be uh, used quite a lot in CSS or HTML and so on. It, it appears uh, HTML is mostly about masking and clipping, not cropping, so... Crop is not used a lot uh, in uh, web APIs, so it's probably fine to, to use it. Um, as I see it, target does not bring much value. Uh, so, um, to, so I thought to myself, ideally we would like uh, a name that 
is very clear about what the object is, what, what its definition is, and so on. So next slide is looking at uh, different definitions that we could have for crop target. And we can define it in different ways. It could be a uh, crop target is a, a serialized object that is used by APIs to refer to out of process DOM elements. And that's how it's being used today. Um, it could be a reference to an out of process bounding, bounding box. Uh, and that's all. That's another definition that, that we discussed. Or it could be, and it's a, a stricter uh, definition, just an object whose sole purpose is to be given to, to crop to, meaning that. It's not specific to screen capture. It's not specific to elements. It's not specific to bounding boxes uh, and so on. And um, so ideally we would pick a definition uh, and then we would pick a name uh, that would uh, highlight the fact that this is really the definition that, that we want. Um, so I, I looked at all three definitions. Uh, next slide. And uh, I think that initially I was inclined to go with um, just the fact that it was an element reference or maybe a bounded box to an element reference. But crop two is a media stream track method. Uh, currently it's dedicated to screen capture, but maybe in the future it might be, crop two might be used for other tracks. Uh, for instance, if you have phase detections somehow, Maybe you want to do uh, face detection cropping as well, and maybe crop two would be fine. Uh, I don't know. So that's why I, I changed my mind a, a little bit. And uh, I thought that uh, the third definition, which is it's an object with sole purpose to be given to crop two, uh, is uh, the definition that, that we want. And um, then we can have multiple definitions somehow. It could be uh, based on element or it could be based on something. And based on that, uh, I think that crop target is less good than crop region. This way we, we are clear that it's not related to targeting an element or whatever. Um, so I, I would favor crop region, which would also align with a spec name. The spec name is media, media capture uh, region or screen capture region. I, I don't know, there's region in the name of the spec. Region capture. Uh, region capture, yeah. So. I'm thinking, yeah, what about crop region? Uh, it seems to me that uh, we could make in, make in the spec that it's very clear that uh, the object is, is not, it, purpose is really to be given to crop two. We would change a little bit the name as well. And then we would no longer have to deal with the fact that, yeah, it's just a reference to an element and so on. Because we, will, we would think in terms of API that it's, it's, uh, it's a region that might change and we can crop a media stream track, which has a lot of video frames coming on and uh, based on, on this crop region, which is just an abstraction for uh, whatever is beneath that will uh, define the region. And that's it, thoughts? Uh, may I go first or is it? Uh, I think yeah. Tim, ah, oh, no, you're first, yeah. But Tim was okay. uh, But uh, Tim, if you would like, uh, please go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to say that it's. Uh, I think if we're going to change the name, we should make it so, or, or come up with a better name. I think we should add the fact that it's a token. It, it isn't a region. It's a token to a region. It isn't a target. It's a token to a target. It should be. If we're going to make a name, we should say that it's an opaque thing, and that should be in the in the name. Well, it might no longer be opaque, depending on what it is. Uh, if it's an element-based region, yes, it's opaque. But if it's something else that we might want to instantiate through other means, maybe it, it might no longer be uh, opaque somehow. Yeah, yeah. The so, problem for me is something like a region sounds like something you can do maths on. You know, in, the, in JavaScript, I can calculate its surface area or something. Or, you know, and I can't. I have similar reservations about crop region. I also read it initially as uh, being like a set of coordinates that I would be able to read 
which is wrong, so that would be misleading. And additionally, it kind of sounds like it's static, right? It's a region, whereas a crop target is something that can move because the target can move. And that is important. Like the entire reason that we have crop target and not a set of coordinates is that that thing can move and that can happen asynchronously from the capture. So I still favor crop target and crop region sounds to me misleading. So now I make you, um, frankly, this is bike shot. Uh, I looked through the issue, M18, which has been open since February. There are exactly three people who have uh, spoken on it. It's allowed and UN, and one other person who claims that crop target is perfect. I see no benefit to anyone in changing it. And I see benefit to everyone who's been discussing this for a while and uh, in keeping it. Let's stop. Bernard. Yeah, I actually think crop two is much more descriptive than these other ones. As was said, region seems confusing. It's like almost like a graph. It would you'd think it would be uh, co include coordinates. So I actually like the I like the current name more than any of the other suggested ones. Okay. What What about the um, um, possibility to clarify that? Uh, well, we could do that in the future, I guess, um, because there the were discussions about yeah, is it an element reference and so on. And uh, I think so. I, I came to a point where I think it's no longer an element reference. It's it's just an opaque thing, and. Uh, the fact that it's an element reference, maybe in the future it will not be uh, based on element, it might be based on something else. And um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll file a clarification uh, issue on that element. Yeah. Sounds good. Then we have a decision or something. That's, uh, so that's just to, education on the text instead of changing the name. So just to be clear, the Consensus is uh, we close issue 18 without changing the name of the interface. And uh, I guess you can suggest clarification uh, through a separate process. Yes. Yeah. Good. And we only like 10 minutes behind schedule. I'll do my best to uh, make up the gap. So uh, now we're going to talk about cropping to uh, non-self-capture tracks. Currently, uh, you can only crop uh, a capture of the current tab. Um, I'm not sure why. So I would I suggest that we allow cropping arbitrary uh, uh, tab captures. I think that there are compelling reasons. So for example, if uh, next uh, slide, please. So this is what possi what's possible right now. We're seeing meeting editors. So basically somebody's got slides and they're in a, in a meet on the iframe. Sorry, who's giving me feedback? Sorry, Harold, I'm gonna mute you. So, um, yes. So the me uh, what we see here is that the local user can see all of the slides, including the sidebar on the left, but nevertheless, they can crop and only show the slide, not show the meat on the right, not show the other slides on the left, and that's perfect for the user. And that's currently possible because the video conference is in the same tab as the slides. Next slide, please. So I don't see why we can't actually extend this to the point that if we've got two tabs, and let's say that I had you know, the meeting on the right-hand side, on one, in one tab, and I was capturing um, slides on the left side, maybe I still want to crop. If these two applications already know how to coordinate and collaborate, why can't they do that if it's in two separate tabs? So unless we can find compelling reasons to not extend our uh, API, I think that we should. Uh, discussion, please. Yanivar, you're first. Uh, yeah, so so the um, so far we don't consider this for self-capture um, for uh, integrated experiences. Um, my concern with allowing us to any page uh, that's being captured is that it might allow sites to set up services that effectively let pages censor themselves. 
So you could see uh, if a popular um, uh, WebRTC service says basically, if you if you give me this um, cropping region, I will crop to it. And if that becomes a common API, uh, a lot of sites might be able to to use that to basically crop to like an empty empty little square, for example, and then basically so, block and censor out information. What's preventing uh, the capturing application from just ignoring this crop target? Like, why would you even apply something? Like, why would you apply arbitrary things from arbitrary sources? I, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm making the point that a site could decide to offer this service. And it's something that we should at least think about. Uh, I'm sorry. It's desirable or not. And and my point is merely to to point out, you're asking for comments, right? So one of yes. the comments is, what are, what are the consequences of these decisions? And I'm not saying maybe we should let pages have APIs that censor themselves, but I, I'm at, le at least pointing out that that might be one consequence of it. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Uh, I remember that this uh, particular point has been made in the past, and that is why we narrowed the scope to uh, self-capture. And I think that there is no merit in this point. And I've uh, pointed out the counter-argument. So I wonder if you've got a counter-counter-argument. So I'll just repeat the counter-argument. It is that no sane capturing website is going to take a crop target from an unknown source received over an unknown media because how how would i even get your crop target if i don't know you in some way right needs to be conveyed over some medium and then apply that and if they do then they've got a very simple solution to stop suffering from being censored they just don't need to crop anymore i think what i explained could easily be built so i don't accept that that is uh unlikely but at the same time i just wanted to make this uh potential, uh, um, uh, I want to make the working group aware of it as, uh, so that we can discuss it. Uh, okay, but let's discuss it now. So uh, is it likely? Uh, you're asking me to assess whether this is likely or not. I, I'm not going to make predictions about the future. No, I, 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 I would I, like to hear from other people on the queue. Sure, but just to say, I, I don't understand how this even works. Like, how would an arbitrary site even give me the crop target? Well, I'm, I'm saying that a service uh, could expose uh, a standard, not a standard, but like a well-known API, and that it could be offered to arbitrary sites. I'm not saying that that will happen. I'm just saying that it's something I'd like us to consider. And uh, when deciding whether this is a good idea or not, um, I don't see any other uh, immediate problems with it. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Yanira, do you, I think you have the token to write up the problem and put it in the put it in the GitHub, since I don't understand it from the verbal description. Okay. And we can go on to ten. So I'm in favor of this. I think given that the token is an opaque token, and it can only have got there by intercommunication inter that both parties willingly went into, I think the risks are probably pretty slim. So, um, I, I, and, and if you disable it, you get the whole screen, you get the whole thing anyway. So I, I don't, I don't see the I don't see a sufficient reason not to do it. I, I'm pretty convinced by it being useful. Would it be reasonable to take up an AI that next meeting either we get a compelling case against this or we, we vote that this is actually uh, something that we should do? Yanipa, would it be okay with you if this were an AI in the minutes? Sorry, and uh, what? I'm suggesting that the minutes reflect the following AI. Either somebody Action comes item. Okay, sorry? thank you. Action item, thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, so I'm proposing the action item that either somebody comes up, you or somebody else, comes up with a compelling case not to uh, extend the API, or we do so by next meeting. 
next to the interim? Well, let me try it differently then, uh, just briefly. Right now, screen sharing is a power tool where the user is in full control. And we have some new specs now, like uh, capture handle identity, uh, which uh, combined with uh, cropping, extends resources where the web applications can gain more control over what this user power tool. Like right now I can share, uh, you know, I can be a, in a WebRTC call with my accountant. I can share a, a page of my bank statement uh, on my bank page. And whether that's a good idea or not is, is uh, on me right now as a user. Uh, we might move toward, by, by changing what screen capture is, from a power tool to where web developers have more say in the matter. We might get into situations where these sites are cooperating and, and the bank now knows it's being captured and it will now redact a lot of the information that I want to convey to my account. Now, maybe that's a benefit, but I think it's definitely real and uh, it will probably Lever, happen. Lever, I'm sorry, but as uh, we uh, add we, more, uh, we're already over. I'm sorry, it's already over time. Okay. If you've got a compelling case, would you be able to uh, present it by next meeting or is that too short notice? Uh, let me think about it. <clears throat> uh, we need to have some timeline. Would you like by the meeting after next meeting? Well, if nobody else finds this compelling, yeah, sure. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Let's say next yes. slide. Uh, anybody else interested in engaging with this proposal? We had the team supporting it. Obviously, I support it. I presented it. Anybody else? I support it. Thank you. Harald. I support it too. Thank you, Dominic. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, next topic: uh, making crop targets stringifiable. Uh, I think that um, it generally helps to make a crop target uh, stringifiable. You can expose this over capture handle. You can uh, message it over shared uh, cloud infrastructure. It just, uh, you know, it's a basic thing that kind of helps. And Previously, there has been some opposition to this, or maybe let's say hesitance. I don't want to misrepresent. So you and you are here. If you could explain to me again why you uh, were opposed to this or hesitant or whichever is the correct adjective, uh, that would be most helpful. Sure. Um, so th there's a way, for instance, from a, a blob object, which might be a megabytes of data, uh, to take an URL. And for that, you create uh, you create the uh, URL from the object. And as long as you have uh, not revoked the URL, then the blob is basically non-garbage uh, collectible. Because uh, a string can be recreated. You, you, even if the string itself get GC'd, it, it might have been uh, stored elsewhere in IDB. It might be recreatable by concatenating, concatenating two strings. So it becomes very difficult to actually garbage collect uh, a crop target. Like if you're doing resource allocation, uh, you will need to keep your resource allocation uh, for the whole lifetime of the element. And uh, that's, that's basically not great to do that. It's much better if we, if we have a crop target, the crop target gets GC'd, then you send an IPC message to the, to the capturer saying, hey, this particular thing that you that we created in the past, now you can release resources and so on. And if we stringify it, then uh, it becomes very difficult. You you cannot you basically cannot do that anymore. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I did not understand it previously, and I still don't understand this because you can have the string. You you might even ever uh, garbage collect the string, but you can garbage collect the element that uh, introduced it. And what's going to happen then is that when you uh, deserialize mm -hmm. uh, and you get a new crop target based off of this string, this crop target will just be obsolete. It will be meaningless and trying to use it will just yield you an error. So and that's basically, it. And basically what you're saying is that uh, you create a crop target and as soon as you create a crop target, you allocate resources and these resources will have the lifetime of the element. No, sorry, didn't say that. And uh, this, uh, let's look at how this could happen right now okay so let's say that we get to the point where we are actually allowing oh okay let's do it even with self-capture let's say you embed an iframe that iframe gives you a crop target and then you hold on to it but you actually detach the iframe the iframe gets the uh, garbage collected its element gets garbage collected you're still uh, holding a crop target but trying to uh to crop to this crop target is not going to help you by much if you but, just but... make it a string instead of a crop target nothing has changed 
Yeah, but what, what I'm saying is that uh, that's not the typical case. The typical case is you create a crop target from the iframe, then you send it and you stop, you, you stop using it at some point and the crop target gets GC'd and then you remove resource allocation. What you're saying is that um, with a string, we can stop resource allocation when the element gets GC'd. And I'm saying, okay, that's correct. That since we are not allowing uh, stringification, currently the uh, GCing of the resources is the minimum between the element and the crop target object. And now you're planning to change it to no longer be uh, capped by the crop target uh, object, but just by the element. Uh, I'm confused because it is explicitly st stated by the spec that the crop target does not actually extend the life, uh, the lifetime of the element. So both cases, you've got something, either a string or a crop target, that is independent of the lifetime of the element. So I, I really don't understand the problem here. So you have three things. You have a crop target, you have the element, and you have the resource allocation, blah, blah. Okay? Um, the resource allocation currently with the minimum lifetime, the, the lifetime will be bound by both the element and the crop target being alive. Whenever any of these- oh, which, which resources are these? I'm sorry. The resource allocation, but for instance, the capture is doing uh, on your side. I'm sorry, this, I don't know what you're talking about. So when you create a crop target in Chrome currently, you're sending an IPC message, you're storing something in a database, and uh, then you uh, you send back the, the crop target. And this thing in, in the database currently uh, is useful until the crop target object is GC'd or the element is GC'd. Because whenever no, any of these- No, sorry, no, deleted, that's wrong. Uh, it's until the element the is, thing in the database uh, is garbage good. collected. It's until the element is garbage collected, not the crop target. The crop target can outlive uh, everything and that's okay, and the resources will be freed, and it's just fine. In right. fact, it's the, we, what, our what implementation I'm, actually uses a string behind the scenes. Sure, but what I'm saying is that uh, looking at time, can we can we try to to? Uh, I can try to summarize cover all cover all the other things. Yes, uh, I request that the uh, minutes, oh, there's also uh, a queue. We have two people on the queue. Okay. All right, so I think I'm next on the queue. I agree with you, N here. Uh, I don't think there's a sufficient use case to 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 stringify. I haven't heard them. Uh, the current use case, uh, if we only cared about cropping self documents, we wouldn't have had crop target either. Uh, we added crop target to solve uh, cross process iframes, and I think that's sufficient. Uh, I agree with the garbage collection. The reason why a crop target is better is it is garbage collectible as soon as any reference is dropped from it. Um, and it, it cannot leave the machine, which I think has some benefit. Um, the, it, if you wanted, uh, to, let me try to clarify the garbage collection situation. If you're saying that crop targets, uh, having, having them stringifiable means you have to keep crop targets around forever, basically. If you, if you don't, uh, for, you could also work around this by basically adding a map, right? So if you really wanted strings, you could you could store your crop targets in a map, have a string that associates to um, a crop target, and it's an easy lookup. However, if if you were to pick a weak map, you would see the problem in that it it would allow the crop target to be garbage collected, which means that the strings are no longer usable. So in, for it to be usable, you would actually have to keep the crop targets alive which seems to be a problem if they're also where you're in Chrome, you're storing, uh, allocating resources, right? I'm, I'm sorry, but all of these are arguments just do not actually match our implementation. And uh, this is possible. I mean, the crop target itself is just a wrapper around the string. So no, you don't need to leave the crop targets alive because you can serialize and deserialize. There is a, constru a, so, a constructor uh, that's not- that in your implementation, You're referring to my implementation as, as the source as, of as the I problem. Understand it, no, right. no, no, not at all. As I understand it, uh, in Chrome's implementation, when you create a crop target, maybe the crop target will 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 last forever. Uh, in other browsers, it might not last forever, and it's good to be able to early on uh, 
grab back these resources. And the crop target object allows that. Not, and if we stringify it, then we lose that. You have it in, uh, so when you stringify it, you just put something on the element that is the string and you can always look it up, uh, back up. So if you, uh, for example, one way that you can uh, solve this is that uh, you put a UUID on the element, and then when somebody tries to create a new crop target from the old UUID, you just search for it. If you find it, great success. Otherwise, you say, hey, uh, this serialization failed. And there, and then you've got uh, the same, uh, so same lifetime for, you know, the string as the element. Name is on the queue. Yeah, so um, my, the previous thing we were talking about, I uh, supported on the basis that it was opaque and now we're making it unopaque. I'm less comfortable with that. I think it's much more difficult to think about what the consequences are of it not being opaque because the opacity guarantees that the two things are collaborating consciously to exchange that that token within the process whereas the moment you stringify it it can go out via some third party advertising server and you don't know what the consequences are um i am much less confident about the safety of it the moment we stringify it it may be perfectly safe but it requires a great deal more thinking about to be sure of that so the only difference between an opaque interface and a string is that uh, the equals equals operator. So with a string, uh, if you have the same string, you know it refers to the same element. It could be that multiple strings refer to the same element, but once you get, you know, two sources give you the same string, you can compare. But everything else, uh, it's completely opaque. If it's a UUID, right? It doesn't tell you anything about the time it was minted. It doesn't tell you, tell you anything. It's a random, a randomly assigned UUID. I don't see the problem. You and just explained that no, there are different uh, in garbage collection, right? Well, but from the developer's point of view, which is where I was coming from, there is a, there is a difference, which is that you there is only there's a very limited number of paths that you can get a valid crop target from one inner frame to an outer frame, or from one tab to another tab, and those are through very limited number of interfaces. The moment it's a string, there are an infinite number of paths. They could be sent over a WebRTC data channel. They could be to put in a QR code that could be like there's an infinite number of paths and we're now saying that all of those paths are completely safe and that the, that the developer knows of the consequences of all of those paths and I'm saying that requires a lot more thinking about than saying we know that it's come through post message. Could, Kim could, could you write that on the GitHub issue so that we can continue the discussion there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, here I suggest again that uh, unless a compelling uh, case can be made about about why this is unsafe and why this cannot cannot be solved in terms of garbage collection, that we proceed with this because various uh, generic concerns about we've not yet uh, done the due diligence can always be raised. It is time to do the due diligence. I believe this to be safe. Can we move to the next this to the next issue? We are five minutes late already. We're five minutes late, but the delay was not introduced on my time. Okay. So my last um, last comment on this one, I'll be short. Uh, uh, we can skip this one. I just wanted to finish the stringifiability. We, uh, we can, in the interest of Intel, we can skip the last slide I've got. Yeah. But so, I just want to say, I think that uh, we need an action item for how we proceed with uh, stringifiability. So unless a compelling concern can be raised, I don't see a reason to delay. I'm not hearing support for it. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, not noting that. Uh, we need to have a proper write-up on this one. And the problems that the issues that people are concerned with seem all to be not with the stringifier, but with the destringifier. How you can construct a crop target from a string. And uh, that is not uh, well understood yet. So I think we, we, need, we need to leave it at that. And uh, Rio is next. <laughs> Thank you, Aram. And so, uh, slide 45. Okay, I made a quick change here, but it's not visible. It's fine. 
uh, I put up the thanks for thanks to all the people who have commented, uh, especially Harald and Yuan, who and I have now made an explainer. Hopefully, everybody had a chance to have a look, and I've listed out explicit goals which Harald wanted, and uh, I think we are in agreement on most of the phase detection goals actually uh, one was to attach to video frame and it is done i think un suggested to use request video frame callback now it's sort of done uh, harald also suggested to return contour instead of bounding box that is something we can again discuss whether we want it in the mvp or not uh, there was a, a there was this thing that we should use phase detection as an input to other APIs like background blur, eye gaze detection, uh, phase framing, and other stuff. You know, it should be easy to use phase detection with a custom, say, eye gaze correction or something like that. So I listed out here how uh, you know phase detection can be used as a building block. Uh, for eye gaze correction, if you do not want to use the system supported eye gaze correction or something else, you want your own special custom eye gaze correction, you can use phase detection first, then run a PCA and hog and some random with some face landmark results, and you can create your own. Similarly, with low light adjustment first you actually have to detect the faces and depending on your face roi the brightness and contrast changes uh, face framing it's obviously you have to detect faces normally what happens behind the scenes is somebody you know you detect the face at a lower fps and the rest is uh, usually done using face tracking uh, so um but uh, yeah, next slide, I'll try to discuss more. So this is uh, uh, the one important uh, thing I think uh, everybody wanted to know about uh, the PNP improvements of this thing. So the first ch uh, uh, chart shows the uh, just camera access, get user media. And the second chart is the way we are planning to do. Uh, let me clarify it has been tested on Dell latitude this 9420 this model only uh, of course we can also use shape detection um, you can see i think uh, the power is uh, i put up relative power here not the exact uh, um, you know absolute power what it's just to avoid uh, problems for us so, uh, but you can get a, a, a idea that how much you know it's almost 2x uh, power improvement so we have used 15 fps because the example where we used uh, uh, tensorflow it was using 15 fps to have uh, and to have this apples to apples uh, you know comparison we uh, put the fps as 15 uh, and uh, we can go to the next slide. I have a, one question there. Should, should yeah, I wait? Yes. Or? Should, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can. Uh, so so uh, I was thinking that the first two, the Chromium plus Get User Media and the WebRTC API, our proposal, would have roughly the same relative power. So is the difference that um, on, the, on the left, you're not doing any phase detection, and on the right, you're asking the driver to do phase detection, and it, it will do some additional processing to actually detect faces, and that's why there's the additional uh, power. Uh, actually, uh, I would let Tukka answer that because it was on his machine he took it. Yes, that's uh, exactly true. So when we ask the driver to do phase detection, it will do some extra uh, processing uh it, we are actually using the intel hardware on the uh die to do the processing so it's not inside the camera but it's on the actual uh, uh package and that causes some extra power when we measure the package over consumption 
I see. In, in some yeah. in some OSs, I would guess that uh, the first two might be the same if if it's just yes. the camera that is doing the thing and we are just exposing the camera. Yes. Uh, uh, I, yes. I oh. have a feeling on Android, it should be uh, almost same because uh, by default, it should do face detection on uh, if it's in auto mode. Or, or or other OSs also. I am not sure about that, but at least for. But we can cross check that also. Uh, next slide. Yes. Uh, thanks, Yuan, for all the comments. Uh, let me start uh, with your. Uh, number three, can I'll start with number three, detected faces as required ID and probably, so ID is very important for face tracking. And if you just want to detect first and then the rest you do tracking, ID is very important. So we should keep ID and the probability should be optional. Um, okay, we can think about it, but uh, all the platforms give the probability. And uh, suppose the web apps, I mean, uh, the developer, uh, he, I don't know, he can make choices based on that. For example, if the probability is a bit high and you have, you want something like funny hats and you, you want the hat on the head only. So, uh, uh, I, I think it might need a bit more uh, con higher confidence score. Uh, for that reason, probability might be uh, important. I mean, we can keep it optional also and, uh, you know, not force everybody to use it. So I am open to that, but um, we'll hear about this from others. Uh, second proposal is, uh, uh you you want us to have a chat with with codex guys uh, and the media working group is that it yeah to me it's the the foundation so you All have right. a very good there is a very good use case there so since they're owning video frame uh we should engage with uh, the people most familiar with video frame to to build uh, right. uh, the co correct construct yeah, right. Sure. I'll I'll mail them right away then. Okay. And now the important one, number one. So yes, uh, I think we started off as a minimal set, then many comments came. And also, it we increased the size a bit. Now, again, um, we should try to fix the MVP. Uh, uh, the mesh part uh, in our goals, I think uh, if uh, we can keep it as next steps and remove from now, uh, everything about mesh, we can remove. Uh, the contour is something Harald uh, sort of asked, and I will ask his opinion on that. And the landmark, uh, I, I, I think for face detection as an input to other APIs, if just in case somebody wants to do a custom stuff, of course, there is the uh, ready-made, I uh, suppose, face framing or something like that. But uh, the landmarks might be a bit important and we should keep it as part of MVP. But again, um, open to discussions. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my point was mostly to say in terms of priority what what we want to to focus on since there are like different things it's at the end i, I can see they, they are all, all of these are, are useful but if if we if we had to choose like in the next right. six months we want to ship that what, what would that be right. and, and then we, right. we focus on that yeah right so uh in my uh in my opinion uh i can remove mesh directly uh, and keep only landmark but uh, I will hear from Harald and others what they say. Oh, yeah, I think let's, uh, yes, go ahead, Harald. Yeah, so 
I still have uh, a problem with this API. I mean, the the power power consumption thing is uh, kind of nice to have, and uh, now that it attached, it's attached to video frame. I think it's in the right in the right place in the system. But uh, still, I have problems okay. figuring out what I can use this for. I mean, the use cases uh, I see in the in in the docs uh, in the explainers just go yes face detection is good but uh, what can i do with a square box or a, a square set of coordinates right but, so uh, so that, that's what that's what uh, gives me all this squishy feeling about uh, mvp which is uh, minimum viable product means viable for something but what's that something Okay, so I think one of the quick answers would be, for example, the landmark part. Uh, you can use this as input because that is something you had suggested, like use phase detection for some custom other work. Uh, at least the ones I put in the previous slide, uh, does that help? The uh, uh, landmarks for doing custom processing for eye gaze correction and others. Or uh, so uh, so landmarks will give me starting points, and so you're suggesting landmarks could be a part of MVP, useful as, uh, as input and algorithm, like funny hats. But uh, yeah, but uh, land landmark detection alone is not enough to do funny hats. Right. I mean, uh, so. Uh, you, uh, well, right now the platforms are, as a, as you know, only giving bounding box. But uh, uh, I think that's why the contour is there in place. But um, uh, how do I say? Uh, uh, yeah, so so I could say I would like a more complete use case for. Yeah, I have one. So the actual functionality is useful, but uh, so, so let's we, go, go down the queue. Yeah, just one use case for you, for you that I mentioned in the past, and maybe we sh I should uh, right. put it on GitHub, is the fact that some encoders are taking uh, regions, uh, specific, specific regions, and will optimize encoding for that specific region, and it's just a bounding box. And uh, having it attached to the video frame would allow some optimizations there. Okay. Thanks. I'll I'll put it in the. That's available. Okay. I'll put it in the. Uh, yes, uh, Bernard. Yeah. No, I was about to echo what you and said. It's actually a big subject of research, which is segmentation within video coding, uh, to because you can basically optimize the encoding and allocate your blocks according to the regions. It's it shows fairly high gain from that. So. I agree with the UN that integrating that with video frame is a pretty pretty good idea. Right. So uh, 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 we have we don't have time, but I want to quickly get some support from at least the chairs and other working groups. Like uh, uh, if we want to start prototyping, or is there like bigger concerns with the integration? Yes, Yaniba. Yeah, sorry, I, I was on the queue. Um, uh, I, I noticed in the explainer, it says face detection API should be anchored to video frame. Uh, it says goals. Face detection API should be anchored to video frame defined in web codecs instead of media stream track, uh, which I applaud. I think this is a good move. Uh, however, I do notice that farther down, it still talks about uh, media track capabilities and constraints. So, so it would appear that it is in both places. And uh, in previous meetings, uh, I was some concern that this API looked like it was uh, uh, solely for um, face tracking that was supported by hardware devices and drivers. And so I'm wondering if uh, you've made any progress on uh, thinking about how this API could be used on sources not from camera. Say, on if you have a video and detecting, it seems like it could be useful to detect faces um from other sources like recorded video 
uh, for recorded, uh, okay, from recorded video. Uh, well, in that case, uh, we I don't think we can use the underlying simil same platform APIs for which we get a big uh, PNP benefit. Uh, uh, so that was not uh, so. Even for recorded video in shape detection, they take each individual image uh, and then do it. And which breaks the tracking tracking part. You can only do detect and you know the a lot of savings are because of the tracking. So uh, uh, maybe we can do, but is it something uh, which is needed because I think most of them, most of the use cases are video conference related, if I am not mistaken. So, uh, um, was it something needed? Then we can again look. I, I would echo Ryu's point uh, that uh, the first target is probably camera. And for recorded video, it seems that if you have a media stream track, you could have a transform stream that would you pipe to, and then it's up to the transform stream to either do it video frame per video frame or to be smarter and do uh, some kind of tracking video frame after video frame. And maybe some kind of shape they take an API dedicated to uh, transform streams of video frames. But it can be done as a follow up when we have like very good use cases. Right. So, so sorry, sorry. So you could, for instance, get that, uh, we could maybe add ways to insert that video frame metadata then. From a transform stream, for example, is that what you're thinking? I, yeah, I think applications should be able to to set this metadata uh, themselves as well, but they they can get it from cameras cheaply. Thanks, Aero. You were planning to say something? Uh, yes. So uh, we have a added the possibility to uh, uh, to add. Uh, uh, Face metadata to video frame metadata. It's already in my explainer. That's an our, our API proposal in explainer. So it's possible to, in our proposal, it's possible to create new, new video frames with a uh, custom face uh, meta, met, metadata. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so. so uh, uh, a quick look at the explainer says that you're using constraints to ask ask the camera driver to produce this uh, this information while the the representation of the information is attached to, attached to a video frame that seems a perfectly sensible way to go what i'd like you to do is to make sure that you have written up in the explainer the exact use case for uh, for enhancing uh, and coding because that's that's the one I can see that's compiling at the time. Okay, I uh, I can add that encoding part there. Uh, but Harald, any any further suggestions? Would you would you be supportive of us trying to prototype this uh, on Chrome? I think so. I'd like to. Uh, I think it's worth trying out. Okay. But, uh, the ultimate decision will be if, whether we can find compelling applications that will use sure. it. Of course, of course. So thanks. I think uh, Yuen uh, was also supportive and uh, Bernard and uh, I think Jennifer, I would like to get your comments also on this. It, it, would you be supportive of if we try to mod the at uh, removing the mesh and a few other things and then if we at least we start uh, prototyping on chrome and uh, then maybe follow up from there make changes from there it's prototyping stage so not shipping i i, I think i still have some concerns about uh whether this information would reveal a lot of differences between different hardware devices and that kind of stuff and making sure we have the right abstractions. Uh, I would also encourage opening uh, an, a, an issue on Mozilla standards positions so we can get a, sure, sure. Uh, I will do that. a view from the entire company. Thank you. Sure, I'll do that. Bernard, your opinions? 
Well, I think I think it's useful to uh, definitely useful to prototype it. Um, I would actually bring the issue of the metadata to the uh, Web Codex folks because I think that that's uh, potentially another another uh, valuable uh, point of integration. Thank you. So yeah, we are running out of time. My action item is add more use cases, uh, especially the encoder one. Number two, talk uh, mail to Web Codex folks. And number three, start prototyping on Chrome. OK. Thank you. OK, we're out of time. Bernard, are we, are we finished? Uh, I think we're I think we're done uh, um, and have everything hopefully in the notes that we need um, and we should chair should probably talk about follow up items but I think that's it for today. See you in July. See you. Thanks.